So, uh, welcome everyone to this uh, streaming meeting and uh, our speaker is Elizabeth Marsden from the English department. She's talking about the uh, text we can see in, in GIF <laughs> images and, uh, and that's uh, something I don't know anything about, so please, please. <laughs> Thanks, Orpo. Okay, so yeah, as, as Orpo introduced, I'm going to be talking about the relationship between uh, the GIF textual component and the GIF embedded text component and other, other text that comes along with it. Uh, okay, so I will just begin with a little uh, telling you what's going to go on in today's presentation. So first I'm going to talk about what exactly is my research and then for those who are not so familiar with some of the kind of internet terminology or things that go on online we're going to do a very brief what are GIFs. Then we're going to look at the current literature and the analysis methods regarding GIFs and any research gap that exists. We're then going to look at how GIFs with embedded text differ from those without embedded text, and I'll go through what those different types of GIFs look like. You know, I'll do it in a proper structured way, so we know exactly what we're looking at. Then we're going to have a look at where the text in the embedded GIF, sorry, the text that is embedded in the GIF actually comes from, like what is the source of those words, how they differ from memes, which you'll start to see that they do look quite a lot like memes, but they definitely have some crucial differences. And I'm also going to introduce a model that was produced in 2016 for analysing GIFs, and I'm just going to see if this kind of slightly new type of GIF fits that model, and if not, why not? So... Uh, just in case there are people here who, especially online, who don't know me that well, uh, I'm doing a current three-year postdoc in digital pragmatics and looking at how people interact in computer-mediated spaces. So this is through all kinds of different uh, electronic devices, uh, phones, through computers, uh, even other people who work in computer-mediated communication uh, might even look at how people interact through things like VR headsets or using robots and other things like that. So it covers that whole gamut of talking to people but using technology to facilitate that. Uh, so I became interested in multimodality in general and GIFs in particular through co-authored research that I'm conducting with Alba Mila Garcia. And this is the research that I presented on two years ago for anyone who was here for that one, which was about the people in the uh, Am I the Asshole group, the enthusiasts of, of that Reddit and, and Twitter affiliated group. Now, we're not going to be talking about them or anything that they've said in this particular lecture, but one of the things they do is they do sometimes post multimodal content. So when they're commenting their, their moral opinions on what's gone on in those posts, sometimes they include images and sometimes they include GIFs. And it was a paper where we were looking at those things that this research stems off from. So I felt I must mention my co-author because if she hadn't proposed that project in the first place, I never would have come up with this one. So what are GIFs? They are a short looping animation format with the .gif file type, and this stands for Graphics Interchange Format. Now, before we go any further, you may have heard this pronounced GIF, that is, in fact, the way the creator of that format prefers it to be pronounced. Uh, I do not prefer this because graphics begins with a hard G, and if it's going to be an acronym, then I feel like it should be said GIF. It's, a, it's one of those ridiculous sort of polarising issues, but I'm going to be using GIF throughout this presentation. So it can be a perfect 
kind of never-ending loop where you don't see the break in the animation. It just goes on forever and ever. And you kind of have no idea how many frames might be in that animation unless you uh, turn the GIF back into its, into its component frames, which is a thing you can do. So like this one of Wendy from Peter Pan with the uh, internally screaming caption below it. Uh, this one's a perfect loop. You'll never see a sort of break or a pause in that animation. Or it can be like it can clearly finish before it goes back to the beginning, like this one of the lady running through her house with all her belongings. And they're often easily identified on social media by the letters GIF in the corner of the image. Uh, and they also typically play automatically, which a lot of video content doesn't. You often have to click a play button to get something like a video to play. Depending on the app, of course, uh, on like Instagram, they might play automatically or TikTok as well. They, they just play. But if you're browsing, uh, say, Twitter, well, or X, as we're calling it now, uh, and you come across this kind of multimodal content, a GIF is likely to start doing its little animation all on its own. And to just make it totally clear, uh, this, this internally screaming one, that has embedded text. So that text hasn't been user added at the point that they would share that GIF. It was added earlier. It's contained within the GIF and inextricable from it unless you were to actually go and edit that GIF. So what does the current literature say about GIFs? Uh, so, oh, well, that's over the top of my... Wait one second, I'm just going to minimise something. That's better. <laughs> I'm reading off that screen and everyone's faces is on top of my text. So GIFs demand minimal time, but they're very appealing. And they have this kind of storytelling and emotional expression capability, but yet they're silent and non-intrusive. So they don't kind of jump scare you in the way that a video that has maybe an audio component might suddenly break you out of your scrolling experience. They just kind of play, they're just added in. Uh, and specific gifts may have conventions and meanings that are specific to communities. And we see this developing with all kinds of both the text based and spoken language and multimedia content where certain groups latch on to a word or an image or a character and imbue it with meaning that's distinct to their little group, like an in-joke. And GIFs have the potential to be used in that way. They're also a community oriented format. So users can make and distribute their own files, which is a kind of important component because something like an emoji, to get a new emoji approved, you have to like send a formal proposal to the Unicode consortium and go through an actual process where you need to justify this is why we need the capability to express this using emoji. New ones are approved all the time. Often when you get a, like an Android update, you'll get a new emoji pack with it. However, things like GIFs and memes uh, are a part of the kind of internet where people can just make stuff on the fly. They're very quick, they're easy, they're accessible. And there are lots of sites where you can just make a GIF by putting in either a video clip or static images and the tool will just compile it into a GIF for you, which means they're very sort of highly modifiable and highly producible. Uh, it may, a GIF, be only interpretable if one knows exactly what happens in the scene before or after that clip. Most of them, they have a kind of iconicity where you can tell why they've been used. They have a sort of emotional uh, or obvious like physical action component where you can tell, oh, OK, this is what that GIF is meant to express. But also, especially as I'll show later in the presentation, uh, sometimes there is subtext and you have to know where that GIF has been taken from in order to appreciate that subtext. Uh, and this paper, Jiang et al., who I've cited here from 2018, they did this really interesting study uh, where they took a group of students 
And they interviewed them and they asked them, hey, one of the questions they asked was, have you ever sent a GIF and it's been misinterpreted? And some of them talked about like generational differences where, for example, their parents just wouldn't have the same interpretation, even of certain iconic gestures as they had. But the one that really mm. stuck out to me was one girl said she had sent uh, a picture to her same age friend, her peer, and it had just been of two characters holding hands and jumping for joy. And all she'd meant to express by that was her joyful attitude towards whatever it was they were talking about. But unbeknownst to her, the subtext of those characters was that they were very known for marijuana use. And her friend had read that subtext into her gif that she had never kind of intended to, to package up with that and had thought that maybe her happiness was in some way drug-induced. And then she was kind of horrified that there'd been this meaning attached that she had never meant to attach to that gif. So they can bring things intertextually from where they've come from and, and kind of bring it into that conversation, whether you mean it to be brought in or not. Uh, and then there's also this tension then between the surface level meanings and the wider context, which is exactly what I've just described. GIFs can also combine multimodal resources from multiple locations. Uh, we don't see this so much, but you will see, I've got one example in a couple of slides time, which does have uh, some like animation that's been brought from one context and put into a GIF that's been brought from another context. So it is possible to combine visual elements from different places. And then GIFs can be independent units of multimodal humour, by which uh, Dinell, who I'm citing here, she means that even like in and of themselves, you can just see that GIF totally in isolation and find it funny because there's some type of humorous juxtaposition or something that kind of triggers your superiority response. Like it might be a GIF of just someone having a sort of funny accident you know, falling down some stairs or something, and then because it loops and loops and loops and you see them repeat that over and over, somehow that kind of builds the humour and it gets funnier and funnier through this repeated looping format. But also, of course, they can construct humour because they're packaged with co-text that then brings a new meaning to that GIF, which is another thing that we will explore. So, the specific model that I've been using for analysing my GIFs comes from Tollins and Samomit in 2016, and they develop, developed sorry, a model specifically for dealing with GIFs, and stated that GIFs had two primary types, one of which was split into two subtypes. So, the type 1 GIFs, uh, they present an embodied or effective response to the prior speaker's talk standing alone as a unique contribution to the dialogue. Whereas the type twos are gifts that are used as co-speech gestures, enacting actions described in text and produced in composite turns. This, the composite turns bit, we're gonna talk about that a bit later. That's almost a function of the technological era in which they were writing. Uh, and these are subdivided into displays of emotional content provided in the preceding text and enactments of events mentioned in the preceding text, which can be real or imagined. And the main distinction here is that type one gifts are giving new information. So someone might say something and a reaction gif is a really typical kind of type one gif. If I some, say something to you and you react to that news as if it's something amazing, you could put in a gif of a character doing like a shocked face or doing like a celebration party face, that would be new information within that conversation. You're showing me your emotional expression through the gif. On the other hand, the type twos are more like if we were talking, let's say about an upcoming party and we were discussing things that might happen at that party, 
And we said that there might be dancing at that party. And then one of us puts in a gif of some characters or some creatures dancing. Then that's like an enactment of the dancing that has already been previously mentioned within that conversation. So that's not bringing new information to the conversation. It's just kind of putting that information into a new modality. It's showing it through the visual mode. Oh, and it's important to say that the, uh, the actions or events that can be described by these subsequent gifts can be kind of anywhere in the conversation. It doesn't have to be the directly preceding turn. So I have taken this directly from the Tollins and Salamir paper because it was just such a really nice, easy example that kind of explained beautifully exactly what they were setting out in their model. And it's worth going through their model in order that you understand it so that I can show later how some of these gifts with embedded text don't quite work within it. So this is example three from their paper. Uh, I've quoted it verbatim. And the text conversation begins with a newsworthy event, which is a romantic coupling. And Sean is describing this event as really good and super fun. And this is a positive stance that is then echoed by Jane. She agrees with him. She says, I'm so proud of you. I'm glad you had fun. And then this positive interpretation is taken up in Sean's next text, which consists of a gift displaying two animated characters with wide open smiles and hands extending. Jane replies to this with a gift of her own, again displaying a positive affect embodied through the contribution of the smiling and dancing child. And the gifts here present embodied actions without any introductory markers. So there isn't like a, Jane doesn't say here, I'm so happy for you, and then put the happy kid. She just uses the happy child to show I'm so happy for you, but in a visual format. And critically, for these gifts to function, this is going to feel like an obvious point, but I think it's worth stating. Uh, the actions depicted must be taken as attributable, not to the person portrayed. So we're not going, oh, this baby is happy. We're going, Jane is happy. We have to in make that inference that Jane is posting this, you know, not to show a happy child exists, but to show this child is embodying my action of happiness. And then this is one of their examples that shows the other type of GIF that is used to animate either an event or an emotion that was in the preceding text. Uh, and in this case, it's a, it's a sort of hypothetical action. So the scene displayed by the GIF is roughly a visual portrayal of the actions being described in the talk. And in this example, we have Claude and we have Greg. And they are talking about going to a party in which Greg has not yet decided whether he's going to be drinking alcohol. So they're talking about who's going to be the designated driver to get them home after this party. And Claude offers to be that driver. And then he uses this gif as a depiction of what the events might look like if he did drive Greg home and Greg was in a very kind of inebriated, drunken state. And this is uh, an image that is taken from the movie Mag Mad Max. So he offers to drive Greg home and then Greg both accepts the prior offer and conveys his understanding of the GIF as depicting a possible future action on the part of himself with the statement, what a day. And this line, what a day, is actually taken directly from that film and is a line spoken by the character depicted. So he's not only saying, oh yeah, this, like I understand the, what this GIF is doing to function in this talk. He also then acknowledges that he knows the source from which it has come. And we're going to see a few more examples where people do that. Uh, in this presentation. And that's like a really common thing that people do to kind of form community and effective bonds with each other. It's showing that they know and appreciate these intertextual links.
So the question that Alba and I are asking in, a, in the paper that's currently in progress, but also that I'm asking in even more excruciating detail in this presentation, is like, what is the difference between the type of GIF on the left-hand side, which I'm standing in front of, <laughs> and the type on the right? Um, and I should say now that this presentation is a bit of a like an elaboration, but also a streamlining of the paper that I'm writing with Alba, because in that paper we're looking at four types of GIFs, uh, of which these are two types. Well, these could be all four types, depending on being packaged with code text. So we're looking at those which don't have embedded text and don't have any co-textual comments from the poster. They're just plonked in there as a, as a whole comment in and of themselves. We're looking at ones only with co-text. So both of those first two categories would be gifts from this side of the sheet. And then we're looking at ones only with embedded text, which would be one of those type of ones, and those with both embedded text and co-text. So then they are two types of textual content. And I just want you to just have a little like innate think about these six GIFs, and in a minute, I'm going to reveal what is the textual comment on those on that side of the presentation. But like, do you have an innate feeling of what would be expressed by these GIFs were they sent to you in a conversation? Like what emotion or, or action or event is trying to be conveyed? And is it easier to interpret these ones than it is to interpret those ones? which is the thing I'm currently asking. So like that, uh, I would say that some of these, if you know the, intertext the intertextual link, if you know where it's come from, some of those you can interpret. So for example, the Crying Fairy, that's, that's from, from the Disney, Disney movie Sleeping Beauty, which some of you might be familiar with. But just seeing the visual, can you tell if she's crying tears of joy, tears of sadness, tears of like a remembrance of the past? I, I don't think it's entirely possible to interpret that. I think there's a level of ambiguity. And yeah, they are, in fact, tears of joy. The caption is, I just love happy endings. This chap getting up, shaking his head and kind of laughing and walking off screen. His textual content is, I can't, it's too much. And then this very subtle animation that's basically impossible to lip read is there's too many of them. I don't think anyone would have predicted that that was the textual <laughs> content of that GIF. So don't get hung up on this thing. This was a horrible thing that I put together purely to solidify my own thinking. So in a way, it sort of never maybe was meant to see the light of day, but it does help to illustrate my level of, oh my God, this is so complicated that I was experiencing while doing this project. So we are going to be looking at GIFs with embedded text, which are replies. So in a reply, where the replier puts in their own text, there are then three loads of textual content. There's the textual content of the original post. There's the textual content, which is the user added content that they've typed themselves. And there's the textual content that comes packaged with the GIF. And then there's like one unit of visual. But unfortunately, of course, the original post can contain a visual as well, which just makes it even worse. And I haven't included that type of one on here because it starts to get just so horrendous, it's actually impossible. So there's kind of seven possible relationships to analyze. How does, the, how does each bit of text relate to each other bit of text? What's the relationship between the image and this text, the image and that text, the image and that text? And sometimes those are all different relationships. <laughs> But first, we should say, where is the text from? So very, very often, as is the case with lovely Whoopi Goldberg from Ghost over there, the text is the original subtitle. It's the original words spoken in the media from which the clip was taken. But it's almost never in a subtitle type font. That one is actually really weirdly small. 
most of them have the text significantly enlarged, so it takes up much more of the screen than it would in a subtitle. And then you also have ones like this GTFO one, where the original text, that is the original text, but it also kind of isn't because it's been abbreviated. And unless you're very sharp-eyed when you're looking at this GIF in its normal size, like tiny on a computer screen, you might not notice that get the F out is written on the whiteboard behind this character. And therefore, I feel like you'd have to know the original media to know that the line is get the fuck out or be good at lip reading because at least he's facing the camera. And then we have ones where the text is entirely new and where the visual content has been altered, like in these two. So this is a, two different types of alteration. The Lion King GIF obviously has been entirely reanimated. If you're unfamiliar with the original movie, the baboon just like holds the lion up and then all the animals surrounding the rock go away, new kin, but basically he doesn't throw the lion. This is an entirely new animation that someone has very seamlessly and beautifully put in. And of course, Yayit is not what was originally said in that part of the movie either. Uh, anyway, anyone who's watching is not familiar with the word yeet. It means to sort of throw with vigor. Uh, and then this one of lovely Daenerys Targaryen from Game of Thrones. Uh, she hasn't been edited, but an extra part has been overlaid. So these uh, dark glasses and the text that says deal with it, but it's awfully fast, which is why I wrote it out as well. Uh, this actually comes from a meme known as the deal with it dog, who is often used for when people are kind of assertively saying, yeah, I've done that, like, what's it to you? That, that kind of attitude, like, you're just going to have to deal with my actions now. Um, so that's been added to her, to a, a very good scene, which does uh, express the same kind of content as the original meme. Because here, she's just burned down a town of, like, slave keepers with, using her dragons. And it is a bit of a you know, a deal with it moment. Uh, yeah, I've done that. <laughs> you know, you're going to have to live with it. And I realise this is a very small data set, the data set I collected with Alba for the paper, but I thought it was worth saying. So for the 24 gifts that we've got with embedded text in that paper, the text sources were three. We have absolutely no idea. We just can't track down where they originally came from. So I don't have a clue if it's the original subtitle or not. Three were clearly user-added text, and original subtitles accounted for 18. So whether those sort of percentages would hold for a much, much larger data set, I don't know yet, but that would be a really interesting thing to find out. But certainly my gut instinct is that the vast majority of these things have the original subtitle, but often in an altered font. So, they're not memes, well, mm, maybe, <laughs> is my kind of feeling on this. So I've put in, so I've put in one, uh, the uh, distracted boyfriend meme, to just illustrate what memes tend to look like in terms of being hugely altered by people and always looking different every time they appear. So... Memes like these GIFs with text are part of remix culture, so people can change them and alter them and redistribute them. Uh, but memes can usually only be interpreted through identifying the, the meanings of the text and the image as like individual components, but then doing a kind of inferential leap where you take this, where you go, okay, you've put this text and this image together they don't necessarily seem to go together. So how can I create a logical structure which explains what the story is behind these things? And uh, the memes are replicating pieces of information that spread through the net through user-to-user -user communication. Uh, so they, they spread massively, they're altered hugely, there are literally, I mean, this one's a super popular one. There's probably literally hundreds of thousands of variants of this thing at this point. And you can just put your own text in on a meme generator and get a new one. 
And some GIFs, especially these GIFs with embedded text and with altered visuals, definitely have a sort of mimetic quality. But the relationship between the text and the content is generally less complex with the text often just describing the visual or be sort of supporting its interpretation rather than bringing a completely new meaning where you then have to do this inferential leap. And I'm going to break this concept down as well in a slightly later, oh no, in the next slide, because I've put that in a more sensible order. <laughs> so, to illustrate how they are not the same, these are, I should say, sort of prototypical examples-ish from both genres. Uh, so, if we just saw the text, camping season is right around the corner, excellent, and we take it away from its meme context entirely, that's all we've got to go on, we could take that as a good faith utterance of someone who just really likes camping. That's fine, that, you know, lots of Finns like camping, lots of Brits like camping. That could be a good faith utterance, hey, camping soon. If we take this cute, sneaky looking raccoon, and we just see him with no other context, we're just gonna go, oh, what a cute little raccoon. There's no kind of inferential extras. But if we put them together, we get this magical thing happening where we then have to do this leap of interpretation to go, why would our raccoon enjoy camping season? And then we have to bring our knowledge of raccoons. Oh, they quite like getting into like people's bin bags and pu pulling food out and eating all kinds of stuff and rooting through human properties and this kind of thing. And then we go, oh, a raccoon would enjoy camping season because it can easily get into people's tents and steal their stuff. However, we don't get the same sort of process when we look at these embedded text GIFs. You can have you in danger, girl. That's fine. That, as a, as a good faith utterance, makes sense. It has logical structure, no problem. Whoopi just kind of shaking her head and looking very severe. I don't know what we could 100% take from that, but we could probably add our own user-generated text if we were going to post that in order to make it sort of mean something. But on its own, I don't know that it has too much kind of intrinsic meaning. And then we don't sort of get this magical thing where you have to do this inferential leap, where you have these together. More you get a kind of point to the intertextual content. Like you go, oh, where's this from? This is from the film Ghost. If you know the film Ghost, it might even trigger a kind of memory of like, what was this scene? Who was in danger? Why were they in danger? But we need that intertextual knowledge. We need that scaffolding. But of course, we can use it as a reply on some other content and not need the scaffolding. Whereas the meme works wherever it is. That doesn't have to be a reply to something someone else has said. It doesn't need co-text. You can just post that and people go, yeah, that's funny. You know, especially if they're Americans in an area where there are raccoons. They, they might have personal, you know, experience of raccoons getting into their tents. But then I found these, which is a kind of, I'm going to call it a memeified GIF. I'm not 100% sure what these things are doing, but they kind of look like memes to me. So these are altered ones of all the same uh, GIF which is uh, a character called Zack who's in The Hangover. This is during a scene where the characters are playing blackjack and he's attempting to count cards and he's finding this process quite difficult. But there are no original subtitles for this scene because it's simply a background musical track and then this like zoom in on the character's face. Uh, the mathematical symbols are all from the movie. That, that overlay was already present. It's just the text that's been added. But I found absolutely hundreds of these things that have been used to express all kind of different emotions, generally around either mathematics or confusion. But still, this is kind of looking like a meme to me because a lot of people have taken it and modified it for different purposes. Uh, and... Yeah, I don't 100, because this is an early-ish stage, I don't 100% know what to do with these things. But it's, it's worth saying they exist. So now we're going back to text-image relationships. 
So while memes tend to have what we call an interdependent relationship between text and image, in other words, uh, neither one can be interpreted alone, you need both to form that full meaning, like the raccoon stealing things from people's tents, uh, the relationship between GIF visuals and their embedded text, according to the small number that I've analysed, I should say, is generally in one of these three categories, which are word specific, so the pictures are largely kind of illustrative, but the text is doing most of, most of the kind of heavy lifting in terms of meaning making. They are duo specific, which I will argue that this one is, where the words and the pictures kind of essentially send the same message, or they're additive, where the words amplify or elaborate on the picture or vice versa. So here we've got uh, a lovely tweet, well, a lovely pair of tweets. What, the top one says, I love airplanes because every few years they introduce a new, worse ticket option. Like why am I booking loser economy where you board five minutes after the plane leaves and your seat is the floor? And then this person has replied, saying, giving Spirit Airlines some ideas. And then we can understand that this is a visual representation of maybe the kind of executives from Spirit Airlines writing down, hey, we, can, we could have loser economy, what a great idea. I would argue that this is one of the ones that works perfectly fine if you take that away. Uh, that it's clearly obvious that they are looking and writing and that with the co-text, giving Spirit Airlines some ideas, you'd be totally fine without the embedded text. Or you'd be totally fine without the visual. They could structure this as a reply that said, giving Spirit Airlines some ideas, and maybe they'd then do Spirit Airlines execs, colon, write that down, write that down, and do it as a bit of like reported speech. And that would still work without the image of SpongeBob and Patrick. So now we have, we're getting into some real complex ones now. The next two are both taken with permission from my lovely friend's WhatsApp group. So in this conversation, my friends and I are trying to organize an online meetup. J and A are in the UK time zone. D and myself, I'm in green. We're in Finland time zone. So these things are always slightly tricky. Well, and everyone is aware that A was out socialising the previous night. So we've got this textual conversation. That's J at the top, who says, I guess we can figure out a time when A is awake. I say, sounds good. Gives me time to go for a walk. J says, brilliant. And then I don't know if the timestamp is actually big enough for you to see, but this is a full hour later uh, at finish time, 14.46 in the afternoon, which would still be... Uh, like quarter to one in the afternoon UK time. A says hello with a laughing face and then asks if we want to do something in about an hour. And then D posts this GIF, which has lovely embedded text that says, good morning, good morning to you, and says it's a plan. J says I, which means yes. <laughs> and A says that in a later time that he's making his mum a coffee and then he'll come online. So, what is going on with this GIF? There are, the more I looked at it, the more I was like, wow, there are so many interpretations. So, it could just be straight up kind of irony, because it says good morning, but yet it's kind of quarter to one in the afternoon, when A, we assume, has just woken up. It could be a kind of display of genuine happiness that A is now available to meet, and it occurs to me that the people who are happy about meeting A, are me, D, and J, who is one female and two male participants. So it even could be a kind of in, uh, like a depiction of the three of us. Uh, or it can be intertextual, since in the movie, which is Singing in the Rain, the characters have stayed up all night and that's why they're singing this good morning song. The lyrics are, it's great to stay up late, good morning, good morning to you. They've stayed up the whole night and now it's the early hours. So it could be a kind of reference or even a depiction because all of the participants know that A was out having fun the night before. Uh, however, I would argue that since the movie released literally 30 years before anyone in this chat was born, 
that it's probably unlikely that they all know this intertextual reference, even though this is a, a pretty famous movie. Uh, I know that Dee does know because I asked him. <laughs> so, so I have insider knowledge. And he confirmed, oh, yes, I kind of meant all of those things. I did the analysis, and then I was like, hey, which one did you mean? And he looked at it and went, oh, yeah, kind of all of those. <laughs> so that's fun. Um, so... I would argue here that the textual component is, again, absolutely crucial for the other participants to be able to interpret why Dee has chosen to post this specific GIF, and that they would at least be able to interpret the kind of ironic meaning of posting a GIF that says good morning at quarter to one in the afternoon even if they maybe didn't get any of the other intertextual links. But that's only possible because the text is there. Now, here's another one from my lovely friends. This one takes even more explaining <laughs> for those unfamiliar. So here we have a screenshot that Dee has posted. These are the achievements to a game that he has been playing. Now, this game has a wonderful kind of ironic, sarcastic sense of humor, and therefore the achievements that you can earn, which means you accomplish certain actions in the game, and then you kind of win one of these things as like a little prize on your online profile. I'm just trying to explain achievements to anyone who doesn't, isn't a gamer. Uh, so you complete certain actions, doing certain things, or at certain times, or killing a certain number of enemies, this kind of thing then you get rewarded with one of these achievements within your online profile. Uh, so the one that Dee has specifically highlighted, he's drawn these little green arrows to show the ones he specifically wants to reference. Say, join the army, they said, meet interesting people, they said. And this is what's called a snow clone, which I'm looking at Luke here, here because we've done some work on snow clones. Uh, and join the army, they said, and then whatever comes next. The whatever comes next is like an empty slot that you can fill with different things uh, to make kind of funny references. And this particular, uh, like, fragile template snow clone has appeared in the Asterix comic, comics, in Warcraft 2, uh, and in the Company of Heroes games as well. This computer is telling me it needs a restart. What wonderful timing. There we go. It's fine. I've told it to go away. <laughs> so he may know this reference from a, a multitude of different places. But he points to these two, and then he says, I got that reference. So this we have this user-added text. I got that reference. And then we have it taken up by A. And what he does is a lot more complex than it looks at first glance. So this phrase, I understood that reference, has become an expression that's commonly used in online forums to show a, like an affirmative acknowledgement that you understand some little bit of pop culture or technical jargon that has been said by someone else. And this is because in the film that it comes from, this character, Captain America, is a man out of his own time zone. So in the film, he's been frozen for like 50 years. He's been magically kind of reconstituted into the modern era. That, that doesn't matter. All that matters is that the kind of joke around his character is he is very kind of naive in, in terms of what's going on in the modern era, in terms of like the pop culture, the music, the films, etc. And he very rarely is able to understand what other characters are talking about if they're doing pop culture references because he's missed the last 50 years. And then this little scene in the film where he says, I understood that reference is one of them making a pop cultural reference. And he's like, I get it. I know that one. That's from my era. So here, D is referencing that bit of the film. A picks up on this and puts in the GIF that shows that exact bit like occurring in the film. So it acknowledges that the comment from D itself is a reference. And then... He also shows that he gets the reference to D having said, I got that reference. So he's mutually showing an understanding 
of, of the referent. Uh, oh, it's so confusing. <laughs> so it's a bit like the, the SpongeBob one earlier with the Spirit Airlines. Oh, that's my alarm. Saying, uh, which represents an embodied action. But in this one, Captain America is both representing A in the here and now, saying I got that reference, and he's sort of representing D in the past uh, because it like references what's already been said. So is it new? Is it new information? Is it new, a new reaction from A? Or is it an enactment of what D was doing? Or is it both? I don't know. But Tollins and Samomit certainly never said that things could be type 1 and type 2 all at the same time. So do the gifts with embedded text for the Tollins and Samomit model. I promise I'm wrapping up now. I realise I've gone on for nearly 50 minutes. So I just put the model back here again so we can re-reference it. And my answer is yes with a but. So all the categories, the type 1s, the type 2s, the A's and B's, they're all still represented, but now the events can be enacted and the emotions can be shown through text as much as, if not more than, sometimes the visual element, which is quite interesting. And then for both emotional content and event enactment, the kind of inner thoughts of, of the person portrayed can be shown. So now we have the option to kind of add dialogue the GIF can also portray events and react to them simultaneously, which is what we saw in the last two examples from the previous slides. Uh, and also I noticed just that something that Tollins and Sam Amit never mentioned, but which I've definitely seen done, is that GIFs can also be used as conversation starters. There's not really any need for them to be packaged in the way they describe, always as a reaction to something else that's been said. You can just send someone a GIF and it be meaningful in and of itself. Like if it's the person's birthday, you send a gif of a cute animated birthday cake with candles on, that's all you need to say. You don't need to say, you don't need any user text as well, or for them to have said anything to you. So they can be totally standalone, which is the thing that Tollins and Saramit did not describe. Additionally, the gif text can duplicate or closely mirror prior text, which enhances this enactment of events. So we saw that in A's use of, I understood that reference, he was mirroring the text written by D in order to make it even more clear that he was perhaps doing an enactment. Wow, that's very late. <laughs> so concluding remarks. These are just kind of concluding remarks and kind of findings at this juncture which is that embedded text is usually the original subtitle. The visual element is usually from a single source, no, not always. For most examples, the relationship between the GIF text and the GIF visual is not the same as what we see in memes, but there are some examples which do kind of flout that. The text often carries the bulk of the meaning-making content, but not always. The Tollins and Samomit model works, but with provisos. And these new GIFs can fulfill multiple functions within that model simultaneously. And then I've got these two extra little bits, which are kind of my going forward, I need to think about them a bit more questions, which are, are they less ambiguous? No, I should say more ambiguous than GIFs without text. They're more ambiguous, not less. <laughs> that shows that it's still a thought in progress, if nothing else does. <laughs> I think they're more difficult to interpret uh, when they have no text, but when they do have their textual component, they are less ambiguous. The text gives them a more solidified meaning, but if you just take the visual on its own, it's difficult to interpret. So it's more and less, let's say both. Uh, and also I think they have the potential to signal footing changes, but I absolutely have not investigated that yet in terms of who's addressed or the tone with which the text is written being different from like the co-text. Like I've seen people make a really serious comment and follow it up with a kind of light-hearted gif which nevertheless expresses the same meaning 
And I think that might be a bit of a footing change thing, but that's something I really need to look into with a way bigger data set than what I've collected so far. So here are my lovely references. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.